Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily's The Sidebar, taking you inside the courtrooms of high-profile and notorious cases from across the country. I'm your host, Joshua Ritter. I'm a criminal defense lawyer based in Los Angeles and previously an L.A. County prosecutor for nearly a decade. You can find me at joshuaritter.com. We are recording this on Thursday, March 2nd, 2023. In this week's episode, the possible ramifications from public statements made by the jury foreperson in Trump's election interference probe, as well as the attorney general facing partisan pressure as special counsel investigations continue into classified documents found in the possession of President Biden and former President Donald Trump. And finally, the continued public statements made by FTX founder Sam Bankman-Fried and the possible repercussions as he awaits trial. Today, we are excited to be joined by Ellie Honig, a former federal prosecutor, legal commentator, and senior senior legal analyst for CNN. Ellie, welcome. Thanks for having me, Josh. We we are never at a loss for legal news. This week has been, uh, I, I don't know, is it more busy than normal? I'll say slightly more busy than normal. I think slightly more busy, uh, especially when you've got the stuff that we're going to talk about, plus some other cases we've been following pretty closely are now coming to a head. But we're excited to have you on, especially to talk about these cases, because I want to talk about what you've been up to uh, recently, not the least of which being uh, your new book, (laughs) Untouchable, How People Get Away With It. I've got my copy. It's excellent. Um, Extremely timely, given the cases that we're going to talk about and the subjects and the people in those cases. Uh, so please tell us a little bit about what you've been up to about the book. I know it's out. I know people can find it on Amazon or wherever they get their books. Yes. Uh, w- what else do you have uh, stirring in the pot? Well, so in addition to my sort of daily duties with CNN, um, we have this is my second book now, Untouchable, uh, which came out a few weeks ago. So I'm still uh, still out there sort of, you know, doing the PR for that. Um, it's gotten a great reception. I appreciate what you said about it. We got really good critical reviews. And yeah, you know, the news keeps evolving in a way that keeps this book timely. We talk about potential uh, prosecutions of Donald Trump. Will they happen? Is it too late? What what missteps have prosecutors already made to this point and can they correct them? Um, I also have a brand new season of my podcast, Up Against the Mob. Uh, season two debuts this week. We came, The episode came out on Wednesday. So I guess yesterday as we're recording this and what I do in this season, the first season I interviewed all different people who I used to work with and maybe against in the mob world. There's an interview with a cooperator who used to be part of the mob. There's an interview with an FBI agent who went undercover. Uh, a, a le- I did one episode with a legendary defense lawyer, a guy named Murray Richman, who represents all sorts of mobsters and celebrities. Um, so that was sort of season one. Season two, we are telling one whole story of basically a crazy case that I worked that involved the Genovese family's effort to take over, colonialize, whatever you want to call Springfield, Massachusetts. And I won't give away too many uh, twists and turns, but I will just tell you that there is a lot of bloodshed, a lot of intrigue, a lot of betrayal. And just when you think you've hit the sort of, oh my God, finisher, there's another turn and another button on it. So there's seven episodes. Episode one is out now and uh, they'll come out every week. I love that. You, you've left us with plenty of intrigue, so we will mm-hmm. definitely have to check it out. <laughs> um, but you did an excellent uh, kind of dovetail into the first case that we're going to talk about today, yep. uh, which is out of Fulton County, Georgia. The four person in the grand jury convened to determine possible election interference committed by former President Trump made waves after making media statements which appeared to telegraph the panel's findings. In a slew of print and TV interviews, the jury foreperson, Emily Coors, publicly stated that the jurors had recommended charges for several involved individuals. Though she didn't mention any individuals by name, she strongly implied that Trump himself could be one of the parties to face charges. When Coors was asked directly about the former president's possible charges, she said, quote, you're not going to be shocked. It's not rocket science. The jury was convened to explore allegations of election interference dating back to 2021 after Trump allegedly made a call to the Georgia Secretary of State pleading the official to, quote, find 11,780 votes, which would have been the number of votes needed for Trump to seal the state of Georgia. While the jurors delivered their final report on the findings in January of this year, only a portion of the details of the report were publicly released this month. After the release of the report, jurors were not explicitly barred from taking uh, talking publicly, so long as their statements remained relevant only to the released excerpts and no details of their deliberations were made public. 
Many are now criticizing Core's statements as prejudicial and possibly undermining the future of the case and the public's perception of objectivity. Trump has himself uh, made comments, of course, regarding the four-person statement, citing them as evidence of, quote, an illegal kangaroo court and the continuation of the greatest witch hunt of all time. Ellie, I know you've been following this story very closely. Jump right in. How big of a disaster is all of this? It's a problem. I'm not sure it would rise to the level of major disaster. Um, first of all, I have been very critical of this four person. I've been critical of the Fulton County DA in several respects. I think that her publicity tour is going to create a headache for prosecutors. I am quite certain that if Donald Trump is indicted, this will become the basis for a motion to dismiss. Ultimately, I don't think that motion will prevail, first of all, because we're talking about a special grand jury here. This is yeah. not the actual grand jury that can indict. This is just a, a grand jury that's giving an advisory opinion, which the DA is free to take or leave. Yeah. Um, it, it, sorry yeah. to interrupt you, but explain that because that is a nuance that a lot of people have kind of missed in the news. Yeah. So ordinarily, when a prosecutor wants to charge a case, you have to go to a grand jury and a grand jury technically has the power to indict. Although I will say candidly as a former prosecutor and Josh, you know this, it's just a tool of the prosecutor. I don't mean that there's nothing nefarious about that. That's It's a completely one-sided proceeding, and that's how it's supposed to be. So it's not as if you have some truly independent entity making a hard examination of the facts here. They basically just spit back at the prosecutors, whatever the prosecutors give to them. Um, but this was a special grand jury, quote unquote, which is – it is a provision under uh, Georgia law that says in certain circumstances you can you can impanel a special grand jury, and, and the DA went to judges and got permission to do this. And they – all they did was – well, they investigated. That's very important. And they've issued this report, but it's not binding on anyone, and it's not an indictment. So the DA still has to take this, and I think that level of separation may really help the DA here because – the argument will be, well, you can't say the indictment was tainted because this person was only over here on the special grand jury. Right. The other thing is the harm would be that this grand juror, that the technical harm would be that this grand juror is infecting and prejudicing the potential jury pool. But as you know, there are all sorts of procedures in place during jury selection where you will weed out anyone who has been unduly influenced. Now, let me give the bad news for anyone who's hoping for a Trump indictment out of Fulton County. Um, this DA, I believe, has crossed the line. You know, you said the key word. Georgia law says, first of all, grand jurors aren't supposed to talk to anybody ever. I mean, it is anathema to me. The notion of a grand juror out there spilling the beans. When the judge, by the way, has said most of this report has to remain under seal, to be right. out there yapping about it is a terrible idea. Technically, the line that she's not allowed to cross is she cannot discuss, and you said this word, deliberations, deliberations. And I've seen some people trying to clean it up for the for, for, for the DA say, well, she didn't really get into deliberations. Oh yes, she did. And here's what she said. First of all, she said, she was asked about Trump in one of the interviews and she said, well, we talked about him a lot in the room. And then she went into yeah. her usual, you're not, I mean, how is we talked about him a lot yeah. in the jury room, not a deliberation. She also talked about specific witnesses by name and she said what the jury thought of them, how the yeah. jury assessed their credibility. Again, you really have to be splitting hairs quite finely to think that's not deliberations. Now, again, I don't think it's going to be fatal, but it's going to be a headache. And the bigger picture problem, I think, is that this grand juror has completely undermined the notion of the fair, impartial, serious grand jury. I mean, the whole reason I believe that the DA impaneled this special grand jury is to give her cover is to, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but is to be able to say to the public, look, we presented our evidence to this very serious, very careful, independent, deliberative body. And they came back and reviewed the evidence carefully. And they recommended that I indict whoever. Now, all anyone's going to ever think of with this grand jury is that woman and, yeah. and uh, Emily Kors and just how, how, unserious she is and how much she seemed to delight in what they had done. And I just want one other thing that, that jumped out at me that I think some people have missed. She said a couple things that are problematic to me in terms of the prosecutor's conduct. Look, it's not the prosecutor's fault. This woman went on a publicity tour. They, they didn't have the ability to stop her. And I'm sure they hated it. She pointed out two things that jumped out at me. One, in one of the interviews, she says kind of casually, Oh, yeah, we were reading newspaper coverage of this case in the grand jury room every day. <laughs> um, the prosecutors the prosecutors saw it and they said it was OK, but we just had to keep an open mind. That's yeah. crazy. That is a yeah. misstep by prosecutors. You you look, it's a little bit of an artificial exercise. I mean, Josh, you know, from dealing with juries and grand juries, but you always instruct juries and grand juries. You are to avoid 
press coverage. If you, what judges always tell juries, if you're flipping through the channels and you see something about this come on TV, change the channel, turn off the TV. If you see something in the newspaper, it's different now with social media, but if you see something in the newspaper, throw out that section of the paper. Um, and now you have not only were the grand jurors looking at media, but the prosecutor said, yeah, it's okay. Just keep an open mind. That's, that's not good prosecutorial practice. The other thing is what this Emily Kors seemed to be really fixated on who was funny. I don't know why yeah. she kept talking about yeah. how with this witness was hilarious. This guy was so funny. And she thought it was really funny that she had sworn in as the four person, one witness on a SpongeBob. I think it was popsicle stick. I guess she held out a popsicle stick and the guy put his hand. I don't know. And she said, oh, because we had just had an ice cream party with the DAs. And I went, what? Now, look, it's quite possible that the DAs just said, all right, guys, you've been here all week. We stayed late Tuesday night. As some thanks, here's a box of ice cream, stupid ice cream right. treat. Who cares? Um, and not an ice cream party, you know, like right. uh, with 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 uh, you know with with balloons and, and, with, and with hats and noisemakers. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but again, it really undermines the notion, the public perception of a neutral, impartial grand jury. Seriousness. It makes yeah. it look like the these grand jurors, this grand jury, was simply a tool of the prosecutor. So I think she did quite a bit of damage, even if it's not yeah. going to necessarily tank the entire case. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you're saying. And I just wanted to kind of flesh out a couple of uh, points that you made, but that I think the only way this says it is that it wasn't an actually indicting grand jury and that yeah. the, the Georgia, if they want to, can come back in and say, okay, now we're sitting our actual indicting grand jury. It's a whole new group of people. Yeah. They're totally tasked in a different way, different four person, different instructions, everything else. None of that is connected. This was just kind of an investigative grand jury. Then it begs the question, why'd you do it in the first place? Exactly. If it's kind of meaningless. Right. But they can kind of say, no, we've we've we're doing a do over here. We've we get a yeah. mulligan and we're doing it the right way again. But the problem is she dropped such a hot mess in the middle of this whole thing. When you're talking about the highest stakes ever, you're talking about yep. the possible indictment of a former sitting president. It This yep. should be handled with the utmost seriousness. And we're going to get into some other uh, instances of, of possible investigations into presidents and former presidents where there have been some missteps. And that's the problem is that these things need to be handled so carefully and by very serious people that when you get an Emily Kors type character who I don't think anybody was all that critical of the fact that she did interviews, though I agree with you, you would have thought they would have instructed them, just please keep your mouth shut till this yeah. whole thing is done. Of course. But the, it doesn't sound like she actually did something per se wrong by doing the interviews. Now, you you make an excellent point of some of the things she said in those interviews kind of went a little bit too behind the curtain into the deliberation room, and yeah. I agree with you on that. But but more than anything, it was her demeanor about these yeah. during these interviews. It was like a game to her. And the whole thing started to look very trivial. Yeah. And then that plays into Donald Trump's kind of ongoing thing that this is a witch hunt. And look at this joke that the, of a circus that they're putting on trying to get me. And I think it just... I don't know where things go. And that's my question for you is yeah. where do you think go, things go from here? But my my view is that wherever they go from here, the stink of what just happened here is going to continue to follow it. Yeah, look, that the image of Emily Kors preening and giggling on TV yeah. will stick with this case. And, and there's just no way around that. Opponents of, of a Trump indictment, people who do not believe Trump or do not want Trump to be indicted will never <laughs> let that right. be forgotten. And it just, as you said, it, the whole purpose of a special grand jury is to lend legitimacy and gravitas to this. And now it's done the exact opposite. I do think it remains quite likely that Fonnie Willis will indict. Um, but I have a whole chapter about this in my book. It's really important that people understand that an indictment does not vindicate or solve anything. An indictment is the start of a case. And there are people out there who are on indictment watch. And the moment there's an indictment, they're going to pop the bubbly and have a ticker tape parade. And there's other people who the moment there's an indictment are going to be infuriated. Yeah. Uh, my advice to both of those camps is take a breath because an indictment is the start of a case. And turning this case in particular into a conviction is going to be a very long, very steep, rocky uphill climb for the DA, starting with the fact that there's a constitutional question about 
whether a local elected county level DA even has the constitutional authority to bring an indictment for anything touching on a federal office or the presidency. There's a debate about whether Trump's conduct did or did not touch on the presidency. But the first thing that's going to have to happen is that they're going to go, Trump's lawyers are going to go right to federal court and ask A, the federal courts to take over the case, which is a thing that can happen, and B, to throw it out. Um, So, and even if you do get to a, a jury, you're not talking about a jury trial till 2024 at I mean at least and and yeah. what's going to what's going to be happening in 2024 Donald Trump's going to be in the middle of a primary likely the favorite maybe the presumptive nominee it's already going to be hard enough everyone goes well in Fulton County Trump's unpopular right and I actually researched this in my book the the, the vote in Fulton County was 72% for Biden but 26% voted for Trump in Fulton County very blue county mathematically 26% Trump voters mean you are 90, I forget, I have the number in my book. I think it's 96% likely to have at least one Trump voter on your juror. I think it's 86% to have two, 70 something to have three. It's a good point. Yeah, yeah. And, and and not only that, let me just one more point on this, Josh, is you're also getting to a point where, where both Merrick Garland and Fonnie Willis have allowed so much time to lapse. We're two plus years out, two years and two months out now that you lose that imperative. You lose that feeling of urgency. And I have friends who lean liberal, who don't like Donald Trump, who have said, two two different people have said to me, colleague, one colleague and one non-colleague friend have said to me in the last couple of weeks, like, it's just, it just feels like it's over already. Like, it yeah. just feels like it's it's digging up old scores to indict him now on January 6th or, or you know, the hush money payments, the stormy Daniel. I mean, that was six and yeah. a half years ago. So yeah. At a certain point, um, I feel like the moment has passed, and I, and, I, and I think there's a chance we could already be there. Yeah, I agree with you. It, certainly, the 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 news cycle seemed to have run its course on it, and I think by the time if this does, you know, start to actually work its way through the judicial system, uh, with the timing of the elections and everything else, it's just going to become a purely political issue, and yeah. and the the merits of it, whether they exist or not, are are going to become. Uh, t- take a second chair to th- just the politics of the whole yep. thing. Yeah. No, I think I think that's exactly right. You can't separate the two. Yeah. No. You mentioned uh, Merrick Garland, so let's move to Washington D.C., where Attorney General Merrick Garland came under fire during a Senate committee hearing Wednesday, March first, where Garland faced questioning regarding a range of topics ignited by the ongoing investigations into Joe Biden and former President Trump. His appearance came mere weeks after the appointment of special counsel to investigate classified documents found in President Joe Biden's possession from his time in the Obama administration. The special counsel investigation will run concurrently with the ongoing investigations into the discovery of classified documents recovered from Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate. Garland has maintained that the appointment of special counsel investigations into both matters emphasizes the DOJ's commitment to impartial accountability to uh, delicate investigations. However, the attorney general faced scrutiny in his Senate uh, committee hearing with accusations of partisan bias as he fielded questions regarding everything from the investigation into Hunter Biden to the drug crisis. Though Garland maintains final authority over the special counsel decisions, the counsels themselves have the ability to bring whatever cases they see fit. The counsels are also entirely funded by the DOJ and are entitled to office space and the autonomy to appoint their own prosecutors. Ali, break this down for us, if you could. What what is this all about? Why appoint these special counsels? Where does this come from? What what is what is the real reason that you think Garland is doing this? Yeah. So, well, let me talk first of all about the, the hearing yesterday. Um, I I have been and and remain quite critical of Merrick Garland in several respects. That I I have a, the the final chapter in my book is entitled "Waiting for Garland." Um, <laughs> I, I'm not I'm not impressed by his prosecutorial tactics approach or spine, frankly, but. I do need to say two very important things in favor of Merrick Garland. He has restored DOJ's integrity and independence. And I think there's plenty of fair criticism of Merrick Garland, but the guy hasn't lied to us. And and you should say, you know, you might be thinking, okay, he's the AG. He's not supposed to lie. The last guy did. Bill Barr sure did. That's the subject of my first book. Um, Did lie to us many times over. And Merrick Garland has remained stubbornly, doggedly, not even non-political. I actually argue in the book, there's a, not only is he not political, he's actually afraid to do something, even if it's necessary, if it might look political. So I think the accusations you saw yesterday coming from Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley that that Merrick Garland had weaponized the DOJ are utterly preposterous. Merrick Garland has done the opposite, I think. I think Merrick Garland has defanged DOJ uh, with, you know, with regard to both 
political parties. Um, he's not brought a substantial indictment of anybody in any position of power. On, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'm putting you on the spot, but there's no answer here, Josh. I've asked my friends this who defend Merrick Garland. I know you're not necessarily a defender. Name for me the single most powerful person of any type who Merrick Garland in his two years as attorney general, including all the U.S. attorney's offices, all 10,000 plus federal prosecutors. What's the single biggest player who Merrick Garland has indicted for anything? Political right. player. No, right. zero. It's a blank right. set. Not right. even a rep or a state, whatever. Someone said to me, the 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 lieutenant governor or a candidate for lieutenant governor in New York. I said, okay, if that's the answer, that's, <laughs> that's then there's your answer. Right. Okay. So Barrick Allen has now appointed special counsel, Jack Smith, looking at Donald Trump, both on Mar-a-Lago documents and January 6th, and then um, Robert Herr to investigate Joe Biden on the documents. I think it was the right move in both cases to appoint special counsel. In Trump's case, I think it came way too late. I don't know why he wouldn't have appointed special counsel right away. The yeah. reason under the DOJ rules, you're, you, you, are, you can appoint a special counsel where there are extraordinary circumstances or a conflict of interest. And here I think it's quite clear. Conflict of interest is you're investigating Donald Trump as Joe Biden's AG. Donald Trump's running against Joe Biden in 2024 and just ran against him. And Joe Biden, the conflict of interest is He's the president. We're investigating him. He appointed me the AG. Um, so I think it was the right move. Now, people sometimes say like, well, what is, but what's special about special counsel? The answer is that there's a bit more independence. Um, a special counsel has all the powers that any U.S. attorney, any federal prosecutor would have to investigate, indict, try cases. Um, a special counsel, the, the regulations say the attorney general, the, the special counsel is, is not subject to the day-to-day -day supervision of the AG. Basically, what's going to happen is both special counselors are going to, at some point, make recommendations to Merrick Garland, indict or don't indict. Merrick Garland then, under the law, has to give those recommendations, quote, great weight, but he can overrule them. If he does overrule them, by the way, he then, Garland then has to file a report with Congress saying, I overruled the special counsel on such and such. They wanted to indict such and such. I did not or vice versa. So there's a bit more transparency there. You listed some of the other institutional factors that provide insulation for special counsel. What's clear to me is Jack Smith has picked up the pace. He's moving much more quickly, more aggressively. We've seen more targeted high level subpoenas in the now four months since Jack Smith took over than we had in the preceding year and change that Merrick Garland was in charge. Um, you know, I genuinely don't know where Jack Smith comes out on January 6th. I think it's difficult for Garland politically, even though there's obvious differences in the two document cases between Biden and Trump. Um, I think it's very difficult to say, yes, we are indicting Donald Trump on documents, yeah. but not Joe Biden. Even that, though there's that, differences, that, it's a tough one. That's what was going to be my question for you is that it, it, it appeared to a lot of people, I'm not the one inventing this idea, that, but, but when they just started to discover documents at Biden's you know, in yeah. his garage next to his car, wherever else they're finding it, that that just kind of, you know, did away with whatever they were going to do with the Mar-a-Lago stuff. Because again, it starts to become a political creature rather than a, a, a long crime type yeah. question at this point. And now it's like, there's no way you can indict Trump on that and not touch Biden on that without everybody pulling out their hair and losing their minds. I, I think that's right. I wrote a column where I, where I made an analogy to offsetting penalties in football. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. if one side, uh, you know, uh, they, they throw an 80 yard touchdown, but the defense had one fingernail over the line. Right. Th that's a bad example. Sorry. If one side had a fingernail over the line and the other side picks up the quarterback and slams into the ground, one penalty is much worse than the other. Right. But they're going to cancel each other out. Exactly. Um, and I think that's what happens here. And people go, well, but there's so many differences. Trump had more documents and Trump sort of Trump potentially obstructed. Biden was somewhat cooperative. They weren't exactly accurate in their public statements. But and, and I get it. I get why intellectually we can list on paper the differences. And those differences might, again, on paper mean the difference between criminal and non-criminal. But this this stuff's not played out on paper. And I don't I do not see how Merrick Garland pulls the trigger on or gets wide enough public acceptance for giving my own boss a pass on a documents right. case, but indicting, seeking to lock up the other guy right. on what's also at bottom, again, with yeah. differences, but at bottom, a documents case. Yeah, N nuance be damned at that point. People are only going to go see the, the, the absolute optics of it. Yeah. I wanted to go uh, one last thing on this. Uh, back to a point you made about Garland and how you feel that he's... Um, you know, kind of remove the, the politics from DOJ. 
I'm curious what you think, though, about the actual execution of a warrant on, mm. on Mar-a-Lago. Because that's where I think, I'll, you know, when that first happened, it, it, it's almost like it set the world on fire. Because everybody went, oh my God. And then to have at the end of that, it be all about these documents rather than, you know, submarine secrets and everything else that people yeah. were speculating that it was. Do you think that that was a misstep? That that created, I'm not saying that it made it him political, but did yeah. it give ammunition to to people to to portray him and paint him as political because he used such a intrusive, yeah. listen, we, we you know, there could have been far less intrusive ways that they could have accomplished that, but the execution of a warrant has now become the raid. Do yeah. you think that was a misstep? I don't think it was a misstep. I actually think it was it was a justified move. Of course, it's going to give. I'm sure Merrick Garland was well aware he would be giving political fodder. And for that reason, they really took steps to do this in a low key way. Right. They didn't have they made they did it when Trump wasn't there. They didn't alert the media. They didn't have you know, we didn't find out about it till after it was done. Um, you know, they didn't take the door off its hinges or anything like that. I think they were very cautious about that. But the key is. DOJ had given Trump's team many, many chances to do it the easy way. First, they negotiated informally. They got some of the documents back, but not all. Then they used a subpoena, which is a legal requirement that you turn over the documents, which Trump's team turned over documents and said, that's all we have, turned out to be false. So I think that it was justified at that point. I think there's no other way you can go in there and ensure that yourself that you're getting all the documents. Of course, it has provided political fodder, and that's the balance that Garland has to strike. But I actually do not fault Garland for going in there in a search warrant, given the extensive efforts DOJ and the FBI had made to do this by the easy way first. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Moving to our last case, this is out of the, the or being handled by the Southern District of My New old York, office. Uh, yes, your sir. old office, what you're very familiar with. As he waged a trial on a number of charges alleging financial crimes, FDX founder Sam Bankman Freed continues attempts to defend himself in the court of public opinion. This likely comes at the detriment of his legal defense as he conducts interviews with anyone willing to listen. Bankman Freed faces a possible life sentence for the orchestration of what's been dubbed one of the largest financial frauds in history. Weeks before his arrest, the FDX founder gave an interview to a crypto blog intimating that political donations made by Freed were intentionally made difficult to track. The statement was seized upon by prosecutors who charged Bankman Freed with criminal counts, including wire fraud and, quote, conspiracy to make unlawful political contributions. Aside from public interviews, Bankman Freed has continued communication with FTX employees, leading to new bail restrictions, which prohibit his contact with past and current employees. In total, Bankman Freed faces a total of 12 criminal charges, which could place him in jail for life. His trial is straight, slated to begin in October of this year. Um, uh, Ellie, first, I, I want to talk about, if, if you could explain for listeners about how it, it, bail works in the federal system, because he was... He was put on this ridiculously high, well, I don't know if you want to call it ridiculous. It was an extremely high bail of $250 million, which he's out on. But he did not actually post $250 million. No. Explain no. to us how that works. And then explain to us why is the judge allowing this conduct on his part to continue? So, well, the conduct be meaning the public statements? Yeah. Yeah. So, first of all, it, um, when it comes to bail, anytime someone gets arrested federally, the prosecutor has to decide, am I going to ask the judge to lock this guy up pending trial or am I going to agree to let this person out? And there's only two factors that you can argue. One is danger to the community. The prosecutors did not argue that with, with Sam Bankman Freed. He's not a danger. The second one is risk of flight. And that would have been the concern. This guy has all sorts of money. He was overseas when, or you know, in a foreign country when we picked him up. Um, he's got unknown assets and resources and there's a chance he could flee. But Prosecutors did not make that argument. They reached an agreement with Sam Bankman Freed's lawyers, with the, which the court approved, to basically let him stay in a private prison. Um, he's basically staying under, I think he's at his parents' house, if I, I believe, yeah. under yeah. heavy supervision. He has to check in. He has to, you know, all these things that we call pretrial conditions. Um, there's some argument that he should have been locked up, but the parties here agreed to leave him out. He hasn't fled. I mean, if he does flee, that's going to sure be egg on everyone's face. Um, but there is definitely inequity in this. I was involved in bail reform, very successful bail reform here in the state of New Jersey. There's been a less successful version across the river in New York. But I, I'm a believer in basing bail only on risk, not on money. 
Um, and this is an example of how rich people can post bail that poor people could never dream of. He has not actually posted $250 million. It is a secured posting, meaning basically that you sign over the rights to various properties, homes, et cetera. It can be friends or family that do that. And then if he flees, this is the disincentive. If he flees, the government can seize all those properties. Um, Which so is still pretty breathtaking that he was able to cobble together $250 million worth of properties yep. that were they were able to put up as surety for this for this bond. But go yeah, ahead. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question how, how exactly uh, he managed to put that all together. Um, it's not the judge's responsibility or power to shut up Sam Bankman Free. That's up to his lawyers and him. Um, he has done no good for himself. You know, it, it's similar in Donald Trump. Well, in some ways, it's similar to Donald Trump, where if you were you think about what if I was the lawyer for this person every day, I would say, please just shut up, just stop, just be quiet. You cannot do any good for yourself. Trump may be a little different because if he ever goes to a jury trial and he's got political fans there, that could help him. Sam Bankman Freed's not really in the same position. Um, I am sure that if I was representing Sam Bankman Freed, my number one piece of advice to him would be shut up. But as you know, Josh, all a, a lawyer can do is advise and recommend. You can't force someone to shut up. Um, Judge Kaplan, who I actually appeared in front of, tried one case in front of, but had a whole bunch of cases in front of. He has his case now. Um, I guess under extreme circumstances, he could put on a gag order, but I don't think it's it's at that level. He's mostly just hurting himself. He's not undermining the process or the judge or the prosecution, really. Um, I should note Judge Kaplan is a very sharp judge. He is a fearless judge. And there is a perception out there that judges often just sort of go along with prosecutors. Which there's some truth to it's a little overstated, but Judge Kaplan, oh no, he almost seems to enjoy poking prosecutors and sort of reminding us that we're not in charge. So uh -huh. he's a he is a bold judge. He also has a very great BS ometer. So, you know, he doesn't take BS from defendants either. So it'll, it'll be really interesting to see. The last point I want to make on this is this is a great example of how quickly DOJ is capable of moving. This is a complex case. This is a yeah. financial fraud case. It took weeks. They had Sam Bankman Freed indicted in a matter of weeks. And so when people say, well, these investigations, speaking of Garland, they take time. You have to dot your I's and cross your, no, no, no. I mean, yes, you have to be careful, but if DOJ believes it has a case to be made and the case is urgent, I have seen them, I'm sure you have seen them move with remarkable speed, yet here we are, Garland and now special counsel are put put puttering along. Right, so right. It, it it undermines this whole notion of Garland as the, the reliable, slow tortoise who's going to get <laughs> there. I mean, maybe he right. will get there, but I think it's too late. So yeah. Right, right. Um, one, one last point on this former FTX head of engineering, Nishad Singh pled guilty to criminal fraud charges, uh, earlier this week, February 28th. Is this, is this now the walls closing in? I mean, listen, I don't know if this man had much of a defense beforehand. It sounds yeah. like this was one of those frauds that was just, you know, being covered up in no way whatsoever, but tell us how the, I've, this was, has been my experience on the outside dealing with uh, federal investigations, but it's all of your friends begin to fall. And then the only one left standing is the one who, who is, you know, in the middle of that investigation being Sam yeah. Bankman Freed here. And this is not like a group of grizzled mobsters who have no. this code where we call, you know, there's no Omerta here. Right. Uh, right. They're going to, it's probably, you know, like flipping pancakes with, with, you know, these are young, rich, you know, elitist type people. Um, it's quite clear that several of Sam Bankman Freed's closest, uh, uh, you know, former part business partners and friends, and I think girlfriend even have flipped on him. Um, you know, you know, to a large extent that will help prosecutors. They'll present the testimony in the way that we always present cooperator testimony. This is a person who was part of the fraud has now admitted his or her liability uh, is facing punishment and is hoping to help themselves by providing useful information. But, you know, there will be the standard defense attacks that you see on any cooperator that this person is incentivized to lie or stretch the truth or just help the government, um, by telling them whatever they want to hear. So, uh, you know, cooperators are usually a valuable resource for prosecutors and can help depending on, you know, there's great cooperators and there's terrible cooperators. And, um, but the good ones done right. And my old office, I will say that we <laughs> we're pretty good at this in the SDNY can, can really make a case for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we will continue to watch this case. I think it's a fascinating case. I actually hope and I think it will end up in a trial because with the amount so. of exposure that this man is looking at, I think it absolutely will. And it's going to be yeah. one of those, 
you know, you got to be a little bit of a legal nerd to be as interested in it as I am. But I, but I do find it fascinating because you're considering just the incredible amount of fraud and the very smart people who were putting a lot of money into this man's hands. And he was just blowing it. It sounds yeah. like, yeah. Um, Ellie, thank you so much for coming on this week. Where can people find out more about you? Uh, I, you know, you can watch me on CNN. I'm on Twitter and Instagram as Ellie Honig, E L I E H O N I G. Because I have this unusual name, I don't have to worry about, you know, John Smith, the, you know, number six, <laughs> underscore six or something. I'm right. the only Ellie Honig you will find on any social media. I feel confident in saying that. Fantastic. We will check it out. And I'm your host, Josh Ritter. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Joshua Ritter ESQ. You can find our sidebar episodes wherever you get your podcasts. And we want to hear from you. If you've got questions or comments you'd like us to address, tweet us your questions with the hashtag TCD sidebar. And thank you for joining us at the True Crime Daily sidebar. Sidebar.